I'm Dr. Gail Gross. I have two very special guests with me today. The first is a well-known author, researcher, and expert on preventative medicine and heart disease. Dr. Dean Ornish was the first doctor to demonstrate the reversal of coronary heart disease without drugs or surgery by adopting comprehensive diet and lifestyle changes. His groundbreaking findings have led to five best-selling books, including Stress, Diet, and Your Heart, Dr. Dean Ornish's program for reversing heart disease, eat more, weigh less, and love and survival. His enthusiasm for his field inspired Dr. Ornish to found the Preventative Medicine Research Institute, and he has continued to educate young doctors as a clinical professor of medicine at the University of California. Among his many accomplishments, Dr. Ornish has been a physician consultant to former President Bill Clinton, as well as many bipartisan members of the United States Congress. He was featured in the Time 100 issue on alternative medicine and was chosen by Life magazine as one of the 50 most influential members of his generation. Also joining us is renowned spiritual teacher Sojel Rinpoche. Sojel Rinpoche was born in Tibet, where he was mentored and trained by revered masters of Tibetan Buddhism. In 1971, he moved to England to study comparative religion at Cambridge and afterwards devoted himself to bringing the teachings of Tibetan Buddhism to the West. Sojel Rinpoche's dedication to his mission resulted in the highly acclaimed book, the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying. Over 1.6 million copies of the spiritual classic and international bestseller have been printed in 27 languages and 54 countries. It has been adopted by colleges as well as medical and religious institutions and is used extensively by nurses, doctors, and healthcare professionals. Sojel Rinpoche is also the founder of the Rigpa Fellowship, which has established Buddhist meditation and education centers in six countries. With his remarkable gift for presenting the essence of Tibetan Buddhism in a way that is both authentic and relevant to the modern mind, Sojo Rinpoche has become one of the most prominent spiritual teachers of our time. Dr. Dean Ornish and Sojo Rinpoche, welcome to the program. Thank you. So wonderful to have Thank you, you both. <laughs> both of you are experts in the healing arts and the healing arts. <laughs> so it's a, an honor for me to have you both here today to talk about what's really important, how to really have a healthy heart and a happy life, two, two pieces that come together as a whole. So I'll start with you, Dr. Ornish. What are your individual perspectives on the connection between the human mind and our physical health? You know, the mind can affect the body for better and for worse. And in our studies, we've been using these very high-tech, expensive, state-of-the-art measures to prove how powerful these very simple, low-tech and low-cost, and in many ways, ancient interventions can be. But these very ancient ideas are really the roots of what not only lead to the behaviors that can cause illness, but through ways that we don't fully understand have a direct benefit or direct harm, depending on what we're doing on our health and our well-being. Yes. Now, for example, heart disease. So often people treat it with drugs and surgery. If you just bypass the problem, that's even the language we use, bypass yes. surgery, for example, without also treating the underlying cause, it's a little like turning off, it's like mopping up the floor around a sink that's overflowing without also turning off the faucet. And the real epidemic in our culture isn't just physical heart disease or obesity or cancer, it's loneliness, it's depression, yes. it's isolation. The kind of things that Sojal Rinpoche yeah. and other spiritual uh, masters have talked about for, for centuries, that yes. we can rediscover and learn from that. Because if we don't treat it at that level, if we just say to somebody, don't smoke or change your diet, it's very hard to get people to do that. So part of the value of meditation, 
of yoga, of other spiritual practices. It's not just about managing or coping or dealing with stress. I mean, the ancient Rinpoches and Lamas and Swamis and rabbis and priests and monks and nuns didn't develop these techniques just to unclog their arteries or lower their blood pressure. Yes. They're powerful tools for transformation. And it's so amazing that in your first book, Stress Diet in Your Heart, you put stress first because you, as a medical doctor, realized and then put into your program stress reduction techniques, realizing that actually that you can have a healthy heart and have a heart attack. There's no question about that. The mechanisms by which our mind can affect our heart and our health in general are becoming exquisitely much more well understood because the stress comes not so much from what you do, more importantly is how you react to what you do. Yes. But, the, but then the question is, why do some people react in ways that are stressful? And I think it comes back to, all, these are ultimately spiritual questions. Because mm -hmm. what these spiritual practices do, meditation and yoga and so on, is not just about managing or coping with stress. They give you the direct experience that on one level we are separate. You're you and I'm me. On another level we're part of something larger that connects us. And having that double vision so that you can become more inwardly defined. You can realize that your sense of who you are, your peace, your well-being, don't come from getting these things, but rather by quieting down your mind and body, you can experience what it means to feel a part of everything as well as apart from it. And then the paradox is you can often go out in the world and accomplish even more without getting sick in the process because the intention behind it is not to get these things that we think is going to make us happy because as all spiritual traditions talk about, we have that already until we disturb it, but it allows us to be more compassionate, more altruistic as ways not of just getting good karma, going to heaven, or some, some external reward, but that's what frees us from our suffering and ultimately allows true healing to occur, not only on a physical level, but on these deeper levels as well. You write in that first book that if you hold someone's hand in ICU, their blood pressure goes down. Or when people come to you and they're ill and they're, they may be having a heart attack and you say to them, how did this first happen to you? They don't say, I had chest pains or my blood pressure went up. They say, when my husband divorced me or my child died or I lost my job or it's always a physical life effect rather than something going on in their body. Well these are very old ideas that I didn't come up with. I mean through language, through um, metaphor, we talk about the heart not just as a pump or as a physical organ, certainly it is and we need to deal with it on a physical level but it's more than that. Through poetry, through art, through music, mm -hmm. we talk about the heart as, a, as an organ, as a symbol of compassion, of love, of wisdom, of courage. Yes. And I think there's more, what science is enabling us to rediscover is that there's more than just a metaphorical basis to that. There's some real truth there that I think has a lot of power. Yes, and in Dzogchen, Sojel, we have the word ah, and that's basically the heart mantra. So is it possible really in today's world to experience peace, to experience a sense of well-being and compassion when everyone is living in such violence and fear and competition in our Western culture. Everyone is just seeking more and more and more without stopping and being. We're always, as Dr. Ornish wrote in his book, seeking that momentary high and then we get that moment and then we have that low again and then we're seeking the high again. So how can we come to a place in our culture where we actually can experience peace. I remember his own Dalai Lama often used to say that the principal characteristics of genuine happiness is inner peace. And that when we have this inner peace, then whatever the outer circumstances may be, that you will your basic being is not disturbed. Or to put it more simply, when he's on the is often asked by people, what is the art of happiness? How to be happy? <laughs> Could you say it in one sentence? Exactly. And I remember him always saying, you see, granted that external situations and circumstances do to a certain extent contribute to one's happiness, suffering, but fundamentally, happiness and suffering depend upon the mind and the heart, how it perceives through the five senses. Yes. So that's why, you see, Buddhism is about, Dalai Lama often says, not about mantras, not about even 
meditation, not even about visualization or yoga, it's about transforming the mind. Exactly. Because the mind or heart is the, we call it the universal ordering principle, is the creator of happiness, is the creator of suffering. Just as also mind has an incredible power to bring about healing, it has also uh, the one that contributes to our being ill. As B Buddha himself said, I remember interesting what you're saying, it's not so much the diet, all these things, but what your mind is. For example, Buddha said, we are what we think. Of course, California said we are what, what we eat. eat. <laughs> I was just thinking that exactly. We are what we think. Ah. All that we are arise with the thoughts. With the thoughts we make the world. So speak or act with pure mind and happiness will follow. So it's very much about the main thing about transforming the mind. Because at the moment you see the mind again is something that's not understood or heart is not understood. Because mind has two aspects. There's an appearance aspect of mind which is where thoughts and emotions are related. But there's also the essence and nature of mind. Unfortunately, what we are doing is just lost in the projection, which is the appearance of mind, and we have no understanding of who we really, really are. For example, we do a lot, we speak a lot, we think a lot, but we have no idea of the doer, the speaker, or the thinker. In fact, I often say to people that we are scattered everywhere and nobody's at home. <laughs> That's why I think we feel very lonely true. or we miss ourselves, yes. ironically. So the whole thing is, you see, the main point is to bring the mind home, where it truly belongs. And that actually is, you see, it's quite interesting. In fact, it's like a, like a camera, for example. When you're showing a movie or projecting something, it just goes on outwardly. But the moment you stop the projection, all the projection dissolves into the projector. So at the moment, we're just always looking outwardly and not inwardly seeing. Can I build on that for a moment? Yes, that's so I mean, because uh, he said that so beautifully. Beautifully. So what we're really talking about is to, when you talk about the projector, is to have that double vision, to see the different names and forms yes. of the movie, but also to see the light behind it. Yes. And you were asking about all the pain and suffering in the world. Mm -hmm. And in working with people who've had a heart attack or cancer or who are suffering, there's an opportunity for transformation there because yes. change is hard. Yes. But if you're in enough pain, suddenly the idea of change becomes more appealing. It's kind of like you go, well, boy, it may be hard, but I'm in so much pain, I'm ready to try just about anything. In fact, if it's really bad enough, there's an opportunity to catch a glimpse. The problem is, is as a physician, Western-trained doctor, I'm trained to kill or numb or bypass the pain, yes. as opposed to telling, helping people use that experience of suffering as a doorway for transforming their lives. As uh, Dr. Rachel Remen says, our wounds are our windows for transformation. Yes. And I think there are a lot of people in the world who are suffering as a as a as not just individually but as a nation there's so much anxiety and stress and fear absolutely and again we have a choice about which direction we go do we go towards more fear more darkness more suffering or do we go more towards seeing that yes on one level we are separate you're you and I'm me but on another level we're a part of something larger that connects us I think it's the most important thing is you see how do we experience that Yes. yes, and how do you how make do you experience it? experience it, bring that about, because yes. it's possible. You see, there's a very beautiful saying by the great Tibetan masters. It says, just as water, if you don't stir it, it will become clear. Yes. In the same manner, the nature of mind is such, or the mind is such, that if you do not alter, that means if you do not contrive, the trouble with this, we might be fabricated too much by too much thinking. In fact, I think you can probably uh, agree with me is the root of all our mental suffering is too much thinking. What would you say would be, Sojel, the practical way that people in their daily life who are watching this show, who are lonely and <laughs> depressed, what could they really do? The nature of mind is such that if you do not alter, do not contrive. If you just allow it to be in its own natural state, then the all unnaturalness, fabrication, all dissolve like the clouds. And then the clear skylight nature of mind dawns. Out of that son of our, uh, in Buddhism we call it Buddha nature or Bodhicitta, the heart of enlightenment, shine forth like the sun.
And the sun has two wonderful qualities, a tremendous light, which is wisdom, a tremendous warmth, which is love and compassion, will shine forth. But people would say that walking in the world today, that they may carry this feeling of calm and compassion and loving kindness, but then all day long they're dealing with people who aren't kind and who aren't loving and who aren't, who aren't being nice to them. And how do they maintain their pose of, of calm under stress? It says in the teachings, says, when the world is full of evil, all mishap should be transformed into the path of body and enlightenment. That you see in the saying in the peace movements, think globally but act locally. Ah. When you really find inner contentment, peace, that peace that you bring, bring peace to others. But what's important is not something easy said and done. Yes. It's something that you have to practice with the discipline and with the really, with the very much how you say focus and yes. if you start doing that gradually it will have impact in fact recent research have shown that through meditation practice that the the parts of brain that form positive emotions like in the case of number of tibetan lamas they've yes. done research and the yes. research been quite astounding yes. they found the parts of brain that form positive emotions such as happiness joy are really very active not yes. only when they're practicing right but when they are actually even in everyday life. So therefore, when you, just Buddha said, we are what we think. If you think positive, and you engage in positive thoughts, like just as in, we can say from a Buddhist therapeutic point of view, is you deal with first the positive aspect of your being, to strengthen that. Because mm -hmm. you've strengthened that, then you can look at negativity with positivity. So Joe, your book, the Tibetan book of living and dying, is really a prescription then for living, dealing with depression, dealing with loneliness. So what is the research that in our Western world we need to back up what now we know is true? We know from experience of tests on professional musicians who have played the violin for like over 10,000 hours, that there is a change in the brain related to the movement of the fingers. So this proves that there is a plasticity, the flexibility in the brain. So it is interesting that different Buddhist meditation practices have been uh, studied recently in the universities in America, and the results have been quite amazing. A high level of activity in the parts of the brain that help to form positive emotions such as happiness, enthusiasm, joy and self-control are very evident and also a decreased level in the section of the brain related to depression, self-centeredness and a lack of happiness or satisfaction. And then also an ability to reach a state of inner peace even when facing extremely disturbing circumstances and an unusual capacity for empathy and entunement to the emotions of other people. And then also, finally, just just make it short, not only this, that, but an increase in the readiness to action. The action section of the brain that actively helps others by putting compassion into action. And so also, meditation in Tibetan, it, it, so there's a word called Ning Jai. Ning is heart. J is when you really just generate the heart of the enlightenment. That's what the power of this compassion action happens. So also meditation, as I was saying, has shown to calm the parts of the brain. Now this is just for ordinary people. Yes. People from the street, people who've done a little bit of meditation. It seemed to really show a remarkable change in the brain that acts as a trigger to calm the parts of the brain that act as a trigger for fear and anger. Mm -hmm. And also these results increase with the amount of meditation with the practitioner who's done like 40,000 hours to 10,000 hours. There is a kind of, you see, yes. increase in this development. Yes, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, I think you would say from a medical perspective, Dr. Ornish, that that is more serotonin, more blood to the frontal cortex, but that you can bring that to yourself through these calming techniques. I find it so fascinating that you were so there, your book Love and Survival, I mean, from a scientific perspective, you noted how important love is to survival. The awareness is always the first step in healing, whether individually or in a social, societal way. 
Meditation can help increase our awareness, but so can research. And part of the reason why I spend so much of my professional time doing research is that it can show us that these things really matter, and they're very powerful. It's so easy to dismiss this as esoteric or touchy-feely, you know. Right. But we are touchy-feely creatures. And, right. and study after study have shown that people who feel lonely and depressed and isolated are many times more likely to get sick and die prematurely than those who aren't, mm -hmm. in part because they're more likely to smoke and overeat and drink too much and work too hard. And your rabbit study. That's right. I love that. Well, a study that showed that rabbits that were touched and talked to and petted and played with, even though they're on the same diet, had 50% less, 60% less plaque in their coronary arteries than Amazing. those who weren't. But even beyond that, these things matter because the first step in any kind of violence that we do is to see the other person as being somehow fundamentally different than us, whether it's in wartime or whether it's in just the day-to-day -day interactions where people do violence to each other. And what all meditative and spiritual traditions ultimately teach us is they give us the direct experience that we're not so different, yes. that on one level we're different, on another level we're the light in the projector, we're a part of something that connects us all. And if we have that, then that creates new strategies for relating to each other and for the world that are ultimately much more powerful and much more healing. Because trying to dominate another country through violence, maybe in the short run we can win, but then history teaches us someone else becomes powerful and they don't forget and then they come back and it, and it comes right back at you. But the people who've been the most powerful in transforming lasting change in our society and worldwide are those who teach nonviolence, the Martin Luther mm -hmm. Kings, the Nelson Mandelas and yes. others. Because when you see the other person as just another form of yourself, it makes it much easier. It, it, compassion comes as a natural outgrowth of that rather than something that you have to tell yourself maybe that's worth doing. It comes out of your own experience. And it's so fascinating that the body is the microcosm in a sense for the macrocosm and so many times you've written about that, about how you translate to yourself really those things that you project onto other people even yes. in a physical way. Yes, it's true. Yes. And part of the value of the kinds of spiritual practices mm -hmm. that Rinpoche and others have written about and, 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 and embody is that they give you that direct experience of what it means to feel that sense of interconnectedness. Yes. And that even the word healing comes from that root. The word yoga comes from the Sanskrit meaning union. to bring together, union. These are very old ideas that were rediscovered. And of course, I'm going to say what neither of you have said, but actually Rinpoche did say earlier, but disease is a disquieting, an unrest in a certain way. Can you talk more about that? And yes, would you, would you tell us more about the practical ways in a certain way that we can bring ourselves into health. But when we settle our mind, then the inner peace dawns. And when that happens, we become whole, we connect with ourselves, then there's also fundamental forgiveness yes. comes, and also the unkindness and harm in us dissolves. And removing the negativity, particularly the cause of violence, the speed and aggression are the cause of really very much. That when it's slowed down in a deep way, in a very peaceful way, you can feel the well-being actually in your body. Exactly. Not just in your mind. Yeah, so case. that's why you see yes. the connection between the mind and body is so evident and linked with heart. Because the root cause of all our problem is me, 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 me. In fact, the, okay. the scientists have shown that people who say, I, 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 have more risk of heart attack. Interesting. <laughs> that was actually my colleague, uh, that Dr. Larry Sherwood. Is that right? So, exactly. so very much fascinating. So, so that when the, when the, you see, when the mind settles this thing, then the negativity and also the grasping tendency dissolve. Then your whole perception changes because you see the main thing is to conquer the mind. If you're able to conquer the mind, then you conquer your perception and your experience. Thereby even the appearance will be different. Yeah. And so as a result, the whole perception changes. That's where the peace is developed. So through that come abiding, the negativity dissolves and then all the grasping. And then out of that, the clear insight of our true wisdom. The interesting thing is you don't have to be Buddhist Not to follow these techniques. In fact, I remember His Holiness saying, I'm a Buddhist because I was born a Buddhist, but actually, be what you are. But, but when you see it from that perspective that Rinpoche right. is talking about and that you're talking about, 
we realize that this idea of selfish and unselfish, that the most selfish thing that we can do is to be loving, compassionate, because that's what frees us from our own suffering. Perfect. And then exactly. we don't have to get into this, well, should I look out for number one, <laughs> or should I help you? Exactly. And the studies have shown that even just watching a film of Mother Teresa ministering to the poor in Calcutta makes your immune system enhanced, exactly. makes your heart, our arteries dilate, and all the ways that we can measure. The one mo emotion that's been most strongly linked with heart attacks and clogged arteries is anger and hatred. Yes. You know, when you point your finger at someone, you have three You're fingers pointing, pointing back, back at you. And so Very when you true. put out anger and hatred into the world, it has a direct toxic effect on you. Yes. When you put out love Wonderful and compassion, point. then it has a healing effect on them and on you. It goes both ways. I there's a wonderful saying, there's no evil like anger. You know, <laughs> Swami Satchidananda built a temple called the Lotus Temple. Yes. And, where there's and a central light that comes up and then it goes and illuminates the altars of all the different All religions, different faiths, even... the idea being that the rituals may differ, the, the, you know, yes. but the yes. essence behind it all, the truth is truth. Yes. And unfortunately, in our current world, fundamentalism is rising because yes. people want the sense of order and the sense of community that often it provides yes. but it's such a destructive way of going about it as opposed to honoring the differences but also seeing the the inherent light that illuminates used all to of say them. Paths are many. Truth is Truth one. Truth is one. Exactly. And I remember he even had a zero for unknown religions That's to right. be equally valued. I'm so sad we have to end this today. I think we need to come back and uh, continue this Happy because continue. it's marvelous. <laughs> Thank you for being such a light in the world. Thank you Wonderful. for coming, you. both of you. Dr. Dean Ornish and Sojo Rinpoche, it has been a pleasure visiting with you both today. Your individual insights into our physical, mental, and spiritual health have been truly enlightening. Thank you so much for joining us, and thank you for watching. Until next time, I'm Dr. Gail Gross. Thank you.